right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Shaheen Mamawala. I'm a Senior Development Officer at VentureWell. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just share a few um, introductory remarks um, before handing it over to our panel. Um, so again, thanks so much for being here today. Um, this is our Community Conversation for Advancing Equity. Um, and today we're gonna to be speaking about validating multiple pathways to success uh, for early stage innovators, as well as creating holistic organizational approaches to equity and inclusion. So just a quick word um, for those of you who are new to VentureWell. Um, so we are a 25 year old nonprofit organization. We focus on supporting innovators uh, in science and technology who are working on complex challenges um, and really specifically helping them to um, move their ideas forward into ventures that are able to scale um, and impact large problems in the world. And today's event is part of uh, some broader work that we're doing around equity and inclusion. Uh, this is actually the third part of our three-part series uh, focused on uh, advancing equity. Um, and the themes for today's discussion uh, ultimately were generated from a study that VentureWell commissioned by a group called Quality Evaluation Designs um, that was really focused on identifying promising practices to broaden, part broaden participation within higher education uh, with a particular focus on STEM and innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and this study really focused on uh, bringing in lots of different voices from around the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, so speaking specifically with leaders of entrepreneurship programs, many students who are pursuing innovation journeys themselves. Um, and then there were also other components, including um, a web review and environmental scan. Um, I wanted to say a little bit also about the focus of the study in the report. Um, so you can see here that um, there's a few specific groups uh, that we really were focused on. And particularly that was um, in the spirit of knowing that um, due to the systems and structures um, that have governed many systems, including innovation and entrepreneurship, um, there are certain groups that are consistently left out, marginalized, or underrepresented um, within the innovation ecosystem. Um, and so these are the groups that we've identified and uh, in the collective, uh, you'll hear us in the report refer to them as underrepresented groups. Um, at the same token, want to make sure that it's clear that, you know, language is adaptive, it's constantly changing. Um, we know that there may be groups that are not listed here um, that absolutely are also um, underrepresented within this ecosystem. And so <laughs> we welcome your suggestions um, and feedback on that. Um, so the, today we're talking about um, two of the six, uh, what we call action areas that the report speaks about, um, validating multiple pathways to success, um, which uh, really focuses on thinking about who or how um, identities and ideas get to be defined, um, and particularly understanding that many innovators come to innovation pathways with different objectives, with different goals, with different community impacts in mind, um, and that it's really important to um, understand and acknowledge how distinct those are and really nurture and support those, uh, those differences. Um, and then as well, thinking about holistic approaches to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Certainly many, many organizations um, are embarking on or deepening or scaling their efforts in this space, um, but really thinking about practical strategies and solutions um, to advance the work. And that's what uh, our speakers today will, uh, will dig into. Um, so in a moment, I'll turn things over to our facilitator, Oni Obiocha. Um, who's the managing director of Sci City, which is the Center for Innovation, Innovative Thinking at Yale. Um, and he'll take an opportunity as well um, to introduce our featured speakers, uh, Juan Barraza and Deborah Joy Perez. Um, before we start, uh, we're going to actually pop up a quick poll um, because it's always helpful for our presenters to see who's in the room. Um, so if everyone can take a quick moment and click through, uh, we'll be able to display those results in a moment. Um, and then just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're definitely uh, welcome um, interactivity throughout the conversation. So please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves, um, to share resources or to ask questions um, as our presenters are speaking. Um, and you can go ahead and direct your questions to the Q&A um, in the Q&A box. 
Um, and feel free to start doing that as soon as presenters start speaking. We will have a longer Q&A portion at the end, uh, but certainly we'll weave that through as well. All right, so let's go ahead and display the results of the poll. Excellent. Great, so it looks like we have a lot of folks from higher education, um, some good distribution across regions and, uh, and other identities. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I would love to pass things over to Oni uh, to get our discussion started. Thank you so much, Shaheen. Um, welcome all. I'm really excited for this conversation today. I'm joined by Juan Raza from Portland State University and by Deborah Joy Perez, who was a senior philanthropic advisor and executive consultant. Uh, Juan, Deborah, thank you so much for being here today. Really excited to engage in this conversation. Uh, as Shaheen said, we'll be contributing to VentureWell's continued conversation around advancing equity in STEM innovation and entrepreneurship. Specifically, we'll discuss strategies and solutions for validating multiple pathways to success in innovation entrepreneurship and how to take a holistic organizational approach to advancing equity. Uh, following our conversation, we will do a Q&A with the audience. And as this conversation goes, please, 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 any questions, comments, concerns, compliments, conundrums, drop them in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A. We're really excited, again, to engage this conversation and we're appreciative of all your time today. And above all else, we want you to leave here with one or two, hopefully three clear action items that you will take back to your university, your college, or your institution of higher education to promote and really implement the conversation and the dialogue and the tactics that we talked about today. So with, with that being said, Juan, let's, let's start with you and kind of just jump right in. Uh, as a director of an entrepreneurship center, how have you offered a more broadly defined version of entrepreneurship to increase student engagement? Uh, and what are some alternative definitions of success that you've seen? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Afternoon, depending what time zone you are. Uh, I'm the, my name is Juan Barraza, Director of Student Innovation at the Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, here at the center, we have programs that help us promote students' innovation and entrepreneurship and create a pathway for them to explore what it's like to be inventor and entrepreneur. Uh, we have the Clean Tech Challenge, that is a PSU program and Invent Oregon. It's a statewide competition that we host every year, engaging the students across the, the region. And one of the things that we, um, we're looking at is to explore how we can engage students, innovators, and entrepreneurs uh, across different backgrounds and geographical zones. In Oregon, when we implemented our Invent Oregon competition, we come to realize that the spirit of innovation entrepreneurship is widely available among our, our students. They're already trying to figure out how to uh, create new ways to grow food, transportation, housing, energy, healthcare. But the opportunity for them is not equally available. The students in a metropol metropolitan area, they have greater access to resources than students in a rural area. And even within the students in the metro area, you will assume they made it to college and they have everything they need to, to succeed. Some of them are facing challenges as housing, uh, food scarcity. So what we try to do in the program is try to identify what are those barriers for the students to be able to focus on their endeavors and, as entrepreneurs. Uh, more importantly, how we can provide them additional resources to help them succeed, right? Uh, many of the students that we interact with, their first generation to, to go to college, uh, they're first in the family to, to migrate to the United States. So they don't have that generational wealth or role model that will guide them through the process of being a college student entrepreneurship. Um, success varies differently from or student to student, depending on their background. Growing up, uh, I was told that success for our family meant to for me to go to college, work in a corporate America, be there for 20 years and retire. And that's a perception and definition of success that my parents uh, put in front of us. 
but that varies different from individual to individual. Some folks are defining success about pursuing their own ventures and their own desire to explore and innovate. Uh, so in order to have a better definition of what success looks like, we need to get to know better our students and the population we work with because could be as simple as, as attaining a, a college degree or being able to launch a venture. Yeah, thank you, Juan. Deborah, anything to add to that when you're thinking about broadly defined version of entrepreneurship, especially to increase student engagement and or taking this idea of engagement and really breaking open the idea of entrepreneurship as it is linked to various versions of success? Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to VentureWell and to you, Oni, and to Kristen and Shaheen, and of course, my colleague Juan for being on this panel. I first want to say, you know, that we're all kind of sitting on indigenous lands, right? All, all the teaching and learning happens on indigenous lands. I am sitting in the beautiful land of the Lenape, Lenny, Lenape uh, which is an antonym for genuine, pure, real, original, and Lenape meaning real person or original person. And I'm proud to be sitting on this land and I know the debt of uh, gratitude and, and, and years of suffering of indigenous people in, in this community and in the country. Uh, I also wanna say that one of my values in self is uh, self-expression, self-identification. Uh, my name is Deborah and I go by she, her, ellas. Uh, pronouns are important, they're about identity. And to your question, the broadest, pro the broadest definition of uh, engagement is inclusion and excellence. And I have been using this phrase uh, time and again, that if you are truly excellent, you must be equitable, right? So you cannot have excellence over here and our diversity efforts over there. They are one and the same. Equity equals excellence. And any entity, especially, we know this from business, those of us in the social science and higher education world have learned greatly from the private sector and business, unless they invest in equity and inclusion, they, they are negatively impacting their bottom line, right? So there is a lot of benefit, not just financial, but equity equals excellence also means that equity equals innovation, equity equals creativity, uh, equity equals better solutions to complex problems, right? So going back to what is what is uh, uh, engagement and entrepreneurial look, looks like, it must be inclusive and it must be equitable. And I will ha I have to end with this: it cannot solely be diverse, because diversity has been abused and misused and fictitious and optical. And you can have, as we all know, those of us who are people of color. I identify as a woman of color, a light-skinned Latina, and understanding that. I have privilege as, as I'm, even though I'm a, uh, I consider myself a woman of color, I'm a light-skinned woman of color, I'm not Afro-Latina. Those of us who have been in this space know that there are many efforts, especially in higher education, that focus on diversity. That's not where the focus should be because you can have diversity and not have equity. You can have diversity, not have belonging. You could have diversity and not have inclusion, but you can never have equity without diversity and you can never have inclusion without diversity. So engagement equals equity and, it, and that equals excellence. That wasn't the question I was expecting though, Oni. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I appreciate both your opinions on everything. So we're gonna really mix it up here. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and I think to that, Deborah, I, I wanna you know, go to you on this next question too. Um, and especially kind of honing into your role at Simmons, can you, can you describe some administrator level approaches to equity and inclusion? Yes. Um, including kind of barriers and decreasing the barriers to access? Right, excellent question. That was the one I was expecting. Let me pull up my manual. There is none, right? So what I, I can give you some tactical, practical approaches to changing and driving equity in your institution of higher learning. It starts, starts first with acknowledging history and the historical context. Most organizations, especially those that are persistently and predominantly white, have, or very few, there are a few, but very few have taken the time to look at it, their own history. I would highlight Georgetown as one of the few that have really dug deep to say, this institution was purchased by the sale of 200 enslaved people, right? Important to say enslaved versus slaves. You know, they were enslaved, they were human beings enslaved. 
at, so acknowledging the history is first. Looking at the data, what is available to you in terms of data? If you're not collecting racial, ethnic, and sub-ethnic breakdown, then you don't know the answer to the question, what does your student population look like? What does your faculty population look like? What does your administrative population look like? So at Simmons, what we did is we immediately after starting, we adopted this uh, notion of inclusive excellence and that we put a stake in the ground and said that we want to be the most inclusive campus in New England. And that, that we want to aspire to that in three areas, in who we are, which is our demographics, in what we do, which is our pedagogy and how we work uh, and who we work with, who are our partners, who are our vendors, you know, what are their positions um, uh, and who are we becoming? If we aspire to be the most inclusive campus, what does that mean about uh, wh where, how we get there, right? Um, so these are, there are real practical approaches. So uh, first acknowledge history, second, do the data, uh, and I would say, do not uh, <laughs> do not look for the bright side of the data or silver line the data. I recently had a conversation with someone who said, well, we showed the data uh, for our organization uh, versus the nation because that made us look better. But they didn't show the data of their organization in the city that they're in, right? Which is majority people of color, right? So be honest, you have to build trust with the community um, and I will say this to my beloved community of color in, that, in academia, uh, and, and I'm speaking to students and administrators. It's everyone's job to create a, a culture of inclusion and equity, but it is it has to be somebody's full-time job. Equity is not a side hustle, right? So if you're also the department chair or you're also the vice president for student affairs, you cannot be the head of equity and inclusion in your institution. It requires people power, and it requires resources. So, you know, to me, the answer to the question is acknowledging history, looking at the data, committing to a goal, um, and just being honest about the investment that has to that has to take place for the work. Mm, thank you. I'm, I want to ask a follow up question to that. If I am in an institution where people aren't even ready to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. How do I go to my administrators? How do I go to my faculty? You know, how do I go to my colleagues, my fellow staff? How do I go, if I have a very homogeneous um, student population, how do I go to my student population and say, this is important and why? How do I begin those conversations on my campus? Well, you know, there's an old saying, start where people are. And if they're not at the point where they're willing to acknowledge and address it, then you have to start with what, what are their values? And let's say a place like Yale has the value of excellence. Let's just say they pretend to be excellent. They uh, pretend to be the best of the best, the brightest of the best. And, I, and then I, what I would do is I would start with data. And this data says that because we are a homogeneous student population or a homogeneous faculty, we are therefore not excellent. Because we know, as I said earlier, equity equals innovation, creativity, good governance, you know, uh, better uh, outcomes, higher profits, et cetera. And if you're looking for a resource to find that data, and that's where I would start, to be honest, Oni, is like, let's look at the data and what the data says about diversity and its value in our sector, in our institution. Pick any um, amicus, I'm not sure if I even say this word was right. Uh, those of you who are lawyers on the call, it's amicus brief or amicus brief or whatever that brief is. <laughs> It is the, 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 the case that's made for every constitutional argument against affirmative action. Go to University of Michigan, Bollinger versus Grotter. Go to Texas University at Austin, uh, what that, whatever that white woman's name who sued Austin because she didn't get a, a, a admitted, uh, but she, did, she, didn't, she didn't sue because there are other white students who had lower grades and got admitted, but she did. She sued because of the black students who had lower grades and got admitted. And when I say grades, I don't mean uh, grades, I mean uh, test scores. So go to all of these advocates. Go to the one that we just had at Harvard, right? At Harvard just had a lawsuit uh, that was, and again, I want to acknowledge that many um, uh, Asian students have been used as uh, scapegoats by um, those uh, white anti-affirmative action organizations. So that case was brought actually by a white anti-affirmative action on behalf of Asian students, right? So go to any one of these cases and it is chock full of data. 
that demonstrates why having a more diverse student body is better for a, the average student, all students. It's not, you know, I, will, I say to folks all the time, being in a, having more diverse environments, it's not just good for me. You know, I have a diverse environment. I grew up in a diverse environment. Being in a diverse environment is better for everyone in the community, right? Student outcomes actually increase if they are in a, a classroom that's more diverse, not less, right? So I would start, if you're challenged with like, no one buys into, you know, white supremacy is a thing. No one buys into the fact that we're not excellent, even if we don't have those other people in our group then start with the data that says, here's the reasons why having more diverse perspectives in our specific work and what the current, the current um, uh, context is for if you, if you are in biomedicine, what does the field of biomedicine look like? How diverse is it or not? And I, made, you know, I think it's important to note that you know, um, white supremacy is inertia. It sustains itself. And so the goal of white supremacy is to keep things the same. And keeping them the same means not talking about them or to do something cosmetically to say, well, we have a lot of Eastern Europeans in our lab, therefore we are diverse, right? And what I'm talking about, I want to be really clear about when I talk about racial equity, I'm talking about historic, you know, descendants of slaves born and raised in this country, the uh, indigenous people, uh, you know, who were colonized, um, those who've come and grew up here multi-generation, whether they're Asian, Black, Latinx, the experience of being multi-generationally marginalized, oppressed, uh, and how that manifests, that's the group I'm talking about, right? So we can fill our classrooms with people that we bring from Oxford University or other places who are excellent and grew up in other, but I want, it, to me, it's the yes and. The growth mindset is the yes. We want absolutely those who have, were educated abroad to come here and share their talents and excellence, but we also want to benefit from those who have been here many generations who have been essentially uh, uh, excluded from those opportunities. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And and Juan, going to you, when we think about, you know, Deborah's talk about exclusion and providing opportunities for people to really understand what it means to be included in this space. How, when you're thinking about, especially in a, a, um, a scenario of higher education, in order to be innovative, in order to get on the innovation entrepreneurship pathway, there needs to be the basic incomes and I'm sorry, the basic needs and safeties of our students need to be addressed. Can you talk more about how we do that for people to feel whole and safe in this space and to go on a path of innovation entrepreneurship? Absolutely. I think that across the nation, we have multiple programs that are already working with K-12 students to get them in that pathway, right? A STEM pathway. The, within the school program, after school programs, here in Oregon, we have Oregon Mesa, which is a high school program. The after school program, the focus on getting students involved in STEM with college students going to the middle school or high schools and teaching them the, the, the STEM uh, Arduinos uh, programming that they need to know to get ready for school. But what is lacking of that is that warm hand off. I think universities, when, once we get students enrolled in our, in our university, we get the best of the best, right? Somehow, somewhere, they battle through and they get enrolled in university. But we're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table by not going deeper in the pipeline collaborating with programs like Oregon Mesa, where students are already in a pathway to be innovators and entrepreneurs, scientists. And by providing a role model, by providing a role model to students, somebody that looks like them, that could be the first step, right? You cannot be what you cannot see. So you are the first one in your family, the Latino, Black, Asian, uh, that goes to school, uh, to college, and you don't see yourself in the student population and the staff and the teachers, does uh, you have to battle everything you have to battle as a, as a college student, plus and the community not knowing your cultural background. So that's that's the first step, right? Role modeling, partnering partnering with programs that will be able to create that one hand handoff from high school, middle school, all the way through college. Uh, then is you already build the relationship, getting involved with our communities right now. It is crucial getting to know the nuances of the Latinx community, the black community, 
and the Native American community in, in the area that you serve as a university, it is crucial for you to understand how can you better serve them. If you start to start getting to know those communities, to know the needs, could be transportation, could be access to housing, and start be thinking creatively uh, about how to solve them, that will be the first step. And this is a big problem to solve, and it's not, it will require a lot of people, a lot of organizations to, to do this. So if we play to our strengths, we can bring partners from government entities, city, county, state level, but also philanthropic institutions that will be able to provide that safety net for the students to be able to succeed. And the pathways will revalidate itself to have a greater number of diverse students, underrepresented students, to go to college and feel like at the found the tribe. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that context. And I and I think in, in knowing that kind of even going back to this first question, the idea that once basic needs and safety are met, then we can start thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship and innovating and being innovative, being entrepreneurial in a way that really aims to find solutions to those lived experience that the individuals, the unique lived experience that the individuals had that brought them to this path. So I think, you know, it's one hand really washing the other, understanding that one's unique lived experience, once those basic needs and safety is met, it can actually be the spur into thinking about and the catalyst and to think about what it means if someone wants to choose a path of entrepreneurship and innovation in a way that best serves them. So I think that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for naming that. And then Deborah, going back to you, when, when you're thinking about engaging stakeholders in equity work, including at the community level, across the entire ecosystem, right? What would you say to organizations, specifically white-led organizations or white faculty who are not sure how to show up? In the same way we kind of talked about it last time, right? I, again, you said talk, um, you know, meet folks where they're at. But oftentimes too, there's a, a, a larger conversation around this idea of calling someone out or cancel culture, right? Something that I've heard a lot in higher ed all over the country and, and at Yale, specifically at Yale too. How do you, how do you, what do you have to say to the folks who are saying, you know what, I want to step out, but I'm, I'm frustrated or I'm concerned that I might step out and fall on my face? Yeah, so I, I have a strong view on this, which I'll, I'm happy to share because you know, you asked me to come here, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> uh, and my strong view is that it's, an, it's, it's unproductive to shame and blame and embarrass a prospective ally. It is completely unproductive and not helpful. I have met in my time at Simmons, uh, and it's a, it's a, a women-centered university, so the majority of faculty are women. A faculty who have spent their life, you know, uh, writing about justice, uh, being involved in, you know, anti-Vietnam, you know, uh, you know, kind of women's rights, uh, civil rights, their whole career, and they are now in the the August of their careers, and they're being told by their 18 and 19 year old students that they are racist white supremacist, uh, and here's a person who spent their entire life working towards social justice. So I have a very strong view about cancel culture. Uh, and I say, you know, uh, that you have to choose who you want to call out. Like you are, think about whether it's making a difference. Now, are you going to align yourself with if you're in a conversation and someone makes a mistake, this is what we say about pronouns all the time. If you misgender or mispronoun someone and you call someone who prefers to be called they or who has the identity, not prefers because it's not a preference, it's I have, uh, they have the identity of they. And you call that person she, apologize and move on, right? So we will, we will make mistakes. Now, I've had also the conversation where you know folks are being told that they should allow for grace and I believe in grace very much but sometimes it's exhausting so you have to like how much grace do I have to give right and how much emotional labor right but I would say I am I am a proponent of calling in not calling out I would not do it publicly or shame someone I've had a cut listen I had a conversation 
post a meeting in which a colleague reached over and touched the other colleague's hair, who was an African-American woman, right? Now, I could have called her out in the meeting, did you just touch so-and-so's hair? That's, you know, that's not helpful. Instead, I took her aside. I said, it's really inappropriate for you to touch a black woman's hair. It's like someone touching your face, your nose while you're talking to them. And here's two articles I want you to read. And, you know, you might consider like, you know, apologizing to check in, but you don't, you know, I just feel, I feel so strongly. And there's actually an article, which I will hopefully after this webinar, we'll have a chance to share some additional resources. So I'm grateful that Kristen is sharing some things I, I happen to remember and post, but there's an article by a, you know, um, an Asian American lesbian feminist who wrote about how this calling out culture among our own is actually anti, you know, social justice. It's actually, it's costing us, right? It's costing us allies, right? Um, so there's emotional labor part, there's the calling out, and there's something earlier that you said about being ready, right? And, and being uncomfortable. So I wanna name that, um, you know, comf discomfort is important for you to feel. It is part of the learning journey. If you're not in discomfort, then you're not growing or learning. I wanna know where you can go get a PhD and be comfortable for the five years you're pursuing your PhD. You are gonna be challenged, right? And, and the purpose of being challenged and being uncomfortable is that you grow and learn, right? So lean in, I've heard, you know, a lot of people say that lean into discomfort. Now that doesn't mean that everybody else, you know, as you lean into discomfort can like, again, shame and, and blame or, or humiliate, but leaning in means doing your work. When you identify some, a shortfall, as I did, I talk a lot about, you know, my experiences, you, you, you know, about growing up first generation, uh, like, you know, Juan, first of my family to go to college. My parents uh, are, came here from Puerto Rico and we call ourselves emigrants, not immigrants. And we were born in this country. My parents had a second and third grade education. I was the first in my family to go to college. You know, I you know grew up poor. I can tell you what food stamps looked like in the 1970s and what the coins were and all that. You know, um, you know, it was very difficult. I had a really hard time, and it was my guidance counselor who first gave me a college application. Uh, and there's a whole story about that you can find on the web. It's called the $25 fund. And so I had a, a lot of hardship. Now, I had this hardship while I was an able-bodied. You know, not I was not physically challenged in moving around. I don't have to worry about when I get to a building, how am I gonna get up these stairs if the elevator doesn't work? Um, I understand that there's uh, people who struggle uh, with, you know, they're, they're neural atypical, right? I did not have that kind of learning disability, although I had a different learning disability, right? Um, I suffer from imposter syndrome every day, <laughs> you know? But what my point is, I still have privilege. I'm sitting in a beautiful house in this beautiful land because I worked hard, yes, but I also have to acknowledge that I have, because I've had the education, because Mrs. Garces paid for my college application, I'm here now. And that I have to acknowledge that privilege and learn from it, right? So that's what I would say to those people who feel uncomfortable is that the lean in and, the, and welcome, welcome to your growth journey. Discomfort is a normal step in the process. You should not be blamed and shamed and humiliated for that discomfort. And uh, the last thing I'll say about that is in order to be, uh, um, to do the work, as I say, right? There's a lot of research. This is not a time in our nation's history when if you wanted to get an anti-racist education, you didn't find it. You just turn over a rock and there's another book or article on being an anti-racist, right? There's a 21 day challenge. There's a bunch of things you can do. But you know you can't just be uncomfortable and say I'm uncomfortable, so I'm leaving. Right? You have to do the work. Doing the work is important, and 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 doing the work will mean we'll move forward and we'll all grow together. Um, I just want to uh, continue in that in that vein, Deborah. I I think you just nail it down that it has to be a, a buffer. It has to be a room, and we endured like uh, the last four years of polarizing views, and we're in the healing process. And part of the healing process. That we have that buffer in both ends of the spectrum to allow some folks to recognize that they're uncomfortable, but they need to do the homework, right? Yeah. You cannot come to me and say, Juan, I recognize that we have done all 
white panels, all white staff. Do you know any Latino professionals that can come and, and join us in the panel? You actually have to do the hard work and go to learn the community. You have to go find out who are these folks, right? And then you can be part of the conversation and say, okay, I know these folks. I, I know Cindy, I know Deborah, I know Oni. Uh, who else do you know? But you already have a, a starting point versus you want me to do a demotional labor to do that, right? Exactly. And, the, and the other end, uh, there, there is right. Folks have endured a lot of hardships and been uncomfortable for centuries, right? And we asking them one more time and be aware of this, that we ask you to allow more grace when they have been giving grace for centuries or years. And some of us, had the fortune to grow up outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. and we didn't have to endure that uh, hardship that some of the folks raised in the U.S., Black or Latino or Native American, have endured. So recognizing that our of, of, of bringing was different and in a way privileged, like Deborah mentioned it, right? Uh, growing up knowing that you can do whatever you wanted and nobody questioned why you're there, that's privilege. And we have to recognize that sometimes we don't have that point of view to the folks that have endured it for five, 10, 20 years or more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I want to come back to this because, again, just knowing the folks who are part, uh, a majority of the folks in uh, on this conversation, listen to this conversation, um, are from higher ed. And knowing that there's so many opportunities that uh, uh, unknowingly individuals might perpetuate or cause uh, harm in the form of microaggressions, it's a form of saying the wrong thing, all these different things, right? I'm thinking about how do we build a container yeah. that allows folks to show up whole. So if you can provide one, two, or three like practical, and you know, Deborah gave some work at Simmons on the larger institutional level, you know, Juan, I would love to hear from you on more of the, the entrepreneurship center level, but what are one, two, or three things that you can do to assure that your um, building a container that can hold the multicultural, multifaceted experiences of the people coming into it. And also, if we can take a lens as much as possible to a holistic approach. I think that's something that VentureWell did an amazing job in their, uh, in their report, really alluding to the fact, actually directly addressing the fact that it takes a holistic approach from the bottom up and from the and, and from the top down to do this at a high level. Can right. you talk about your own experiences, what that looks like in practice for yes. folks to take away and execute at their own university? Yeah, so first I wanna acknowledge that, you know, um, I think I heard you say in our prep call that you actually implemented a holistic approach uh, in, at Yale. And, and perhaps, you know, as I asked you in that conversation, you can define that for the group because I do think people, you know, don't quite understand what holistic means in the context of organizational culture change. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is very deja vu. I appreciate you bringing that back up. So when I think of holistic approach, and when I'm asking this question, it's really this understanding of who are the stakeholders and what are the opportunities for them to be involved in the center and what all goes to building on a center. So when I'm thinking about a holistic approach, it's understanding what is, and all these things we did at the, the Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale, it's one, having at least a monthly workshop to directly for staff. So staff can have the opportunity to upskill themselves on the individual, uh, the institutional and the systemic approaches of oppression, of power, of privilege, of race, of gender. And in higher ed, it was actually easy for me to facilitate because I can just knock on the door of the Native American Cultural Center and say, hey, can you teach us what a land acknowledgement is, right? I can knock on the door of the LGBTQ Center and say, hey, we wanna do pronouns, but we, we wanna do it intentionally and we wanna do it in a way that's informed. Can you provide some insight into my staff? So really leaning on the resources already in university was really important to us. And that was on the individual level. Mm -hmm. On the institutional level, one thing we did was looking at something, we built out something called the SCRJ, the Social Equity and Racial Justice Framework. And our communications and creative director actually um, administers this for every program that Sci City launches. So a program manager would go to the communications and creative director who would go and say, okay, in, in developing and in marketing and promoting this program, I need to ask you a couple questions. 
One, who are people, what populations aren't usually in this programming? So if you're talking about Finance 101, if you're talking about Lean Startup Methodology, if you're talking about um, you know, biz, Business 101, whatever, um, Ed Tech, Healthcare Tech, whatever it is, who, what individuals are usually not a part of this conversation? And then what can you do to get them into this conversation? So again, looking at the, and this was a mandatory aspect of how we built programming. You had to get go through the SCRJ in order for you to get your program out and marketed. So you had to think through this. That's and then the systems change right there. <laughs> exactly. And then another thing that we did was really think through, okay, you know, and this is something I hear a lot from folks who kind of reach out to me and say, Oni, our university is so homogeneous, right? So white. My university is so white. <laughs> it's, it's so, so white. So what does it mean to really understand, like, yes, the university might be white, but where are you located, right? Thank you. New Thank you. Haven. New Haven is one of the most diverse, diverse cities, cities, right? And Yeah. Right? So how do we work with the city of New right. Haven and folks in the community, paying them to come here, honoring yes. them as individuals and do, do this yes. work well? So that's how we're thinking about the holistic approach. So those Excellent. are some clear takeaways from me, but I would yeah. love you off anything to add to that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the bait because I'm so glad you set me up. So one is acknowledging that your university is in one of the most diverse cities and acknowledging that because it's an institution of higher learning, it is tax free, right? They're, that they, are give a ta they give a gift, but higher education sits on land. They don't pay local taxes and that depletes the resources of the city. I, I'm not the expert in this, but there are plenty of papers on this issue. I want to go back to this thing that you mentioned about engagement with the community. And I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. Let's go ask them for their data. Let's go study them. Let's go to their schools and mentor their kids. And I could check off. I was a, you know, I, I did some mentoring in the community, or we got some data from community. So it is about respect, right? Let the community speak for itself. You know that old phrase, nothing about us without us, right? In what ways are you authentically engaging the community in which they feel seen and heard and respected? And are they helping to co-design whatever is the program that you're trying to implement in community, right? So it's not being, that you're not doing something to them, that you're working in partnership with them. And so then that's just the one thing I want to say about that community engagement. It is a thing and you can do harm, do no harm, right? You can do harm by engaging uh, not just ineffectually, but in, in damaging ways, connecting and engaging with community, right? So this holistic thing is really important. And I wanna acknowledge, I see some of my dearest uh, uh, friends and mentees uh, on this, uh, in this meeting. There's a bug in here and that's why I'm going like this. <laughs> but um, uh, I, uh, when I think about this work, I think about two things. One is uh, what's called results-based accountability. And this focus on when you're doing systems change, you're looking at the person, role, and system. Like, what can you do at the individual level? Level. So there's that. The, this is what we were talking earlier about doing the homework, right? Doing the personal work. What does that look like for you? You know, take the 21 day racial racial challenge, race challenge, right? Now noticing racism. Eddie Moore, uh, Debbie Urban, who wrote the book Waking Up White. Uh, it's it's just go to website Google 21 day challenge. You'll find it. If you are, uh, if you need to do that personal work first. So that's the person. The role, which is what you did in instituting that pro, that policy, that is a, 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 something you as a, as in your role had control over. I want to go back to the individual. I there's there's a program done by the People's Institute and Beyond, which is phenomenal, called Undoing Racism. And I would say if you've never uh, studied the history of slavery and, and racism and how we got to where we are, do that three-day workshop. I think it's virtual now. Uh, go uh, watch Amend on Netflix about the 14th Amendment. There's a lot of the resources available to you right now in uh, doing the personal work. In the role, person role system, the role is where are you a gatekeeper in your job? What do you have control over? What you've demonstrated, Oni, is you had control over appro approving programming, and you put in place a process that would, in, that if not ensure equity, at least bring the question into, into existence, right, to talk about it. And the system is that that gets adopted, not just for your program, but every program 
on campus and everything you do. Is it the president, is uh, the university leading the charge? That's a system, right, on advancing equity. It means HR looking at, you know, what is their processes for hiring? How is equity showing up in every job description? How are they interrupting bias in the solicitation and the hiring process so that they're not recloning, they're not reproducing themselves? That there are tactical things and approaches that you could do as part of HR to so start with everything from having a conversation with a hiring manager about what is what are the competencies, not the credentials, let's put those aside. What are the competencies you're looking for for this job? Because if you require a PhD to be a, pro, a research assistant, you are already limiting the pool of people of color in your, in, your, in, in your search. So thinking about competencies, thinking about rubrics, about what is it that you're looking for and thinking about that before you look at the first uh, resume. So there's a tip sheet that we came up with at Simmons with my colleagues in HR that we use for every, man for every manager or hire hire, meaning they had to, to go to a, um, a, uh, a, a workshop on anti-bias in hi bias in hiring so that they could be prepared. So these are like systems things that you could put into place in an institute, a role person system in the institution. But the point that you're making though, is has to happen at every level, right? Thank you, yes. Juan, please. Yeah, no, and to what David, David, David said, um, so many things that are you control, what things you can control, right? If you are in the program, uh, in our case, we are in the program level, we're community facing. The first thing we need to do is our staff, right? Uh, when we started growing our staff, who, who is not representing our staff? And when we interview candidates, we want to make sure that at the bare minimum, we reflect the demographics of the student body that we serve, right? And we intentionally, when we look for candidates, we require that the talent pool that we interview is diverse. And we look at the, to whatever I mentioned, the qualifications that we're asking. Asking a PhD to come over and do work uh, a certain level might not be the best use of the skill set and or benefit the community program. The next piece, um, because there's so much work to be done, is hand to hand comeback with the students. Uh, tapping into the larger community, role models, right? We know that we don't have enough role models that will be able to inspire our students. We tap in a large portion of our volunteers and mentors pool into the community, business owners, professionals, city leaders that will be able to come in and talk to the students. And that creates a soft way to inspire them because they see themselves in a position they can be once they're done with the school. Um, same, thing, same thing with mentors, uh, we do the same approach. Um, for us, it's recognizing our own strengths. We know that we have limitation on what we can do at the center, our office, our university. And then we're looking to complement with other programs or entities to create a pathway for the success of our students. It doesn't help me if I try to retain the best students in um, Portland or in PSU if I don't provide a pathway for them to succeed. And the only way I'm gonna be able to do that is to create a connected tissue with organizations that will do that. Uh, at PSU, with, through Venture Well, we bring students or uh, Lemos on MIT, for example, they, they run a program that's open for uh, student innovators. And every year we do our best effort to get those students, the students channel over there. So tapping in a collaboration spirit and thinking about how we can better serve our students as role models, mentors that look like them, partner with the community and create pathways from your region and beyond. I'll just say, can I just say one more thing about the HR component and like who we hire and everything? Um, so it's important for, when I said earlier that you start with data, that you just don't look at who's there, look at who left, right? So you want to look at the demographics of like who's there, you know, and how long have they been there? Where are they concentrated in terms of people of color? What positions are they in? Who got the promotions? Who got the tenure? And who left and why? So no surprise that we're in the midst of a conversation around why Cornell West was denied tenure at Harvard, right? Uh, a leading uh, African-American woman scholar at Yale just left because she was tired. 
sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay, the system works in oppressing and persisting a culture of racism. So you have to work against it. So, you know, again, the 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 recently I posted something on, on LinkedIn and I invite everybody here to link with me on LinkedIn. I've got a lot of great contacts. <laughs> And uh, it was a little like meme, and I thought it was so great because uh, it's, it makes this distinction between diversity and equity that I laid out earlier. And I, I said this in our, in our kind of our prep call, diversity is a fact, right? You can measure it, it's, it's a numeric, it's a fact. Equity is a choice. And what equity is a choice means is where are you putting your money? Where are you investing in terms of equity? Not giving everyone the same, but adapting so that the person who are further, the persons who are furthest behind have the most investment. Inclusion is an action that you take. Like if you are going out to lunch in your unit and you notice that only the white people are going out to lunch or only the black people are going to lunch, why is that other person not being invited to lunch? It's an action, invite them. And then belonging is the outcome. And that though you get that data by collecting and doing an, a, an annual climate survey or whatever it is that you do, make sure diversity, equity, inclusion are part of that survey. So I just want to call, name that. <laughs> well, I just point something that is, is very obvious. But culture, right? If your university department unit does not have the cultural uh, understanding to welcome individuals with diverse backgrounds to be ready to deal with different representations across the board, people will not stay, right? Doesn't matter how hard we work to bring those individuals on board, right. they don't feel welcome, they feel isolated, they feel like a tokenized, yeah, tokenized. And it's about culture. You, your team, talking about the hard work that needs to happen early on. Yeah. The team needs to be ready to do the hard work to create a, a culture that promotes inclusivity, equity, and it's open for everybody, truly open yeah. for everybody. Yeah. So yeah. they don't stay because it is not a welcome and an inclusive place. And that's why I said you have to capture the data, not just who's there, but who left and why. Yeah. yeah. Talking, talking about inclusion, uh, Addis Castillo, uh, Castillo from Citywide Youth Coalition and also from People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, who runs on doing works, racism workshop has a, a great question in the Q&A. Um, inclusion does not necessarily get at addressing the institutional policies That's right. that sustain racist practices. Yeah. Um, Juan, let's start to you and then go to Deborah. What is the role of anti-racism, if at all, in this journey to equity? Let me think for a second. Um, I think the pipe dream is to see everybody for what they bring to the table, who are as individuals, regardless of background, color, ethnicity, or gender. We need to start recognizing in our own personal journey that our own biases, and we all have them in some capacity. And to what Deborah alluded earlier, recognizing you have a problem is the first step. This, the next step is doing the, the, the work, right? As as we move in a day-to-day -day basis, and I know that we will, we talk about, I talk about having a buffer and tolerance across the board, you need to be able to say no more. In the last couple of weeks, I've been in, a, I've been in board members, and I've been in boards where the female board members or EDs have been taken down by an external uh, contributor, and we had to say no more. Same thing happened with uh, gender, racial inequities you see in in day to day conversations. We have to stop and say there is no more. And this is going to be hard to hard comeback. It's going to be awkward moments. It's going to be the moment that you use your best judgment to put people aside, given the opportunity 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 to learn. But it's going to be times that you have to be uh, upfront and act in the moment. Yeah. Uh, it requires courage mm -hmm. and honesty. And when you are put in those positions, deliver the stern message, tough mother love, but uh, you have you have to do it and be kind. The, deliver a strong message, be kind uh, to those individuals, even when you have to tell them that they're, they're in the wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to piggyback on that and say 
that I, you know, when I talked about not calling out and, and calling in instead, if there's a moment of harm happening, that's where you have to call out, right? So that's an instance, instance when you have to be an upstander and interrupt bias in the moment, right? If somebody is being uh, uh, embarrassed publicly, you have to stop it. And, and there are tools and tips. You go to any upstander training, it'll say, wow, Juan, ouch, Juan, I, you know, what did you just say? I mean, can you say that? I'm not sure you meant, well, what you said made me uncomfortable, so I want to give you a chance to clarify, you know, or if you notice that the people of color around the table are not being heard, or if they, are, if they speak and, and it's, tone, you know, there's tone deafness around that or silence, and then somebody else says something that's the same as that person of color just said, and suddenly everybody hears it, right? That's an ex example that happens all the time of being invisibilized and ignored. Like the ideas, like as if, you know, the, the, the folks of color in around the table are speaking into the ether and then it comes down on the hold on the, on, in the brains of the white folks around the table. There's a joke that my, uh, my boss <laughs> used to tell me, he says, you know, that a phenomenon like that where a, 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 a white woman executive says to a white male executive, you know, uh, you know, such and such idea. And, and the male executive said, oh, you know, Mary, that's a great idea. Maybe one of the men will propose it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you want it to be heard, right? So I want to get to uh, Addis's uh, question because I think it's an important question. And, and it's like the inclusion alone in one single unit does not change the institution, right? Uh, to be an anti-racist organization is vertical and horizontal. Like everybody has to take it on, right? And um, uh, I recently ha gave a talk on this uh, a concept of uh, having a, um, a, uh, a race equity mindset and what it means. So I just put it in the, in, the, in the chat. And it really is paying attention to the patterns of inequity and the outcomes due to this false you know, hierarchy of human value based on race, right? and then doing something about it, like really acknowledging it, taking responsibility for it, the, and developing a set of practices to undo it. And that's why I love the People's Institute and Addis was actually one of the facilitators of that session that I did. So I'm a big fan. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, does, it does have to be kind of, it, it can't just sit like, oh, having said that though, I have to, my side um, tangential point is, if you're an institution that is just not healthy, and has no has made no room for any progress uh, in equity, and you're feeling stifled and silenced and all these things. Then you need to plan for your exit strategy. But while you do that, create a center of excellence in your immediate, you know, unit or whatever where you do have control and can exercise and facilitate equity. Do that uh, for survival. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you so much, Deborah. Everyone in attendance, thank you, thank you, thank you, our panelists and Ventual for always being able to host a platform to allow folks to speak truth to power. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll take it back to Shaheen. And again, thank you so much for folks who joined us today. Great. Hey, thanks so much, Oni, Juan, and Deborah. Um, this was an incredibly rich conversation, and I know we could have continued. I feel that we could have <laughs> kept going for quite a while. Um, I did just want to let everyone know uh, that we have recorded this, and that recording will be shared um, on our site, so I will chat the link of where that will show up. Um, definitely encourage you to please share that with others whom you work with, um, anyone else that you think would like to uh, listen in. Um, and I also just wanted to, to say before we sign off, um, we always uh, really welcome your feedback um, on what you've heard, on what you've learned, uh, and there will be a brief survey that will come early next week. Um, so as, as always, uh, thank you so much for everyone who was able to join in person. Um, please, you know, help us in continuing to share this recording um, and get the message out. Um, and thanks again to everyone uh, who, who brought their, their insights, their ideas, um, and their incredible wisdom to the conversation. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.